I, I really can't uh, thank the Maine Irish Heritage Center for this very kind award that they've given me tonight. <clears throat> St. Dominic's is truly a, has left a very large spot in our lives. <clears throat> I, I can only remember, it seems like it was only yesterday that I was working Beano games in the school next door. And we had AA meetings over at the school. You've heard of a lot of, about the good things that took place in my, my life, politics. But I always like to remember that things weren't always that great with uh, <clears throat> Gerard P. Conley Sr. If Jerry made it sound like I was a little tough on the boys during the years. Uh, maybe I was, but <laughs> the one that laughed the loudest was the guy that I was laying on the most. <laughs> but their mother, God love her, uh, she was a, a saint if there ever was one. She took good care of them. And uh, uh, she treated them with all the compassion that one could ever expect. You know, uh, I, I want to tell you this because there are a lot of young people here this evening. And back when I was 11 years old, I was Peck's bad boy. My parents were the greatest parents, as any kid would say about their parents, the greatest parents that you could ever want. But I made their life miserable. <laughs> I made their life a nightmare. And my brother David and his wife Jane are here from Pennsylvania uh, today to pay tribute to the patriarch of the family. <laughs> But it always wasn't that way. I became, when I reached 26 years of age, I had already destroyed, destroyed whatever kind of hope that I may have had in the future of gaining something. I had a terrible problem with alcohol. But I remember uh, one evening, after uh, knocking my head against the wall too many times, my father always told me, Jerry, you keep it up. And he said, you can hit that wall as high as you want. Your head's gonna get a little softer, but that wall is gonna stay solid. And one day I decided it was time to do something about it. And I went down to 379 and a half Congress Street the E.C. Jordan building right across from the Central Fire Station. Alcoholics Anonymous was up on the third floor. And I remember going up those three flights. And I got inside that room, and I looked around, there were about 20 people there. And I can assure you that most of them were in the 60s, 70s, and late 70s. And this young lad at 26 years of age didn't feel at the moment that he really belonged there. But as I came through the door, I happened to notice on the wall was this very huge framed poem. And I looked at it, and I'm gonna hope I can remember to give it to you tonight, because it hit me right between the eyes. And it goes something like this. When you get what you want and you struggle for self, and the world makes you king for a day, just go to a mirror and look at yourself and see what that man has to say. For it isn't your father, your mother or wife whose judgment upon you must pass. The verdict who counts most in your life is the one looking back in the glass. And some people may think you're a straight shooting chum and call you a wonderful guy.
Just a second. Well, I'm losing it. Oh, okay. But the man in the glass says you're only a bum if you can't look him straight in the eye. But he's the fellow to please, never mind all the rest. But he's with you clear to the end. And you've passed your most difficult task if the man in the glass is your friend. You may fool the whole world down the pathway of years and get pats on the back as you pass, but your final reward will be heartaches and tears if you've cheated the man in the glass. That changed my life. <clears throat> in the front of the room, they had the so-called 12 AA steps to recovery. I only had to read the first one and that changed my life around. And that clearly stated, and I accepted, that I couldn't drink, that it made my life unmanageable if I just took one sip. Because one drink <laughs> was too many, and a thousand wasn't enough. That was 54 years ago. And I've been sober since. <clears throat> 